Hi everyone, my name is Dr. Jocelyn Anderson and I'm an assistant teaching professor in the Journalism, Communication and New Media and English and Modern Languages departments at Thompson Rivers University. I live and work on traditional Shewepam territory in Kamloops, British Columbia, Canada. One thing that I love about my research about film culture and the cameo and small parts is that although there are many film traditions, Hollywood cinema is an important part of our shared, popular, and participatory culture. Whether we're in Moncton, Montreal, or Kamloops, Hollywood offers us a repository of shared screen culture. Both movies we've seen, on TV, on the big screen, downloaded or streamed, and cameos we've recognized, chatted about, or shared as memes and gifts. While I love festival films and international cinema, there's something fascinating about big movies that we share across socio-economic boundaries, whether Star Wars or Shawshank Redemption. What we think of as our shared moving image history is changing with the advent of streaming services, as the structures that limited our access to films and television are developing new schedules and patterns of viewing. Like it or not, our moving image culture is bound up with films that historically have come out of U.S. movie production, focused around Hollywood. In Canada, we often gripe about the inability of our domestic film industry to challenge the dominance of Hollywood. As Canadians, though, many of us would be hard-pressed to recognize a Canadian star. Many of the stars who we think of as ours, a recent conversation about Eugene Levy comes to mind, are recognizable in Canada only after they have been made famous through the film machine of Hollywood. Because the cameo relies on shared recognition for its power, who we think has earned recognition becomes an important criteria for establishing what counts as a cameo. The effects and importance of the cameo have been explained in many ways in popular and scholarly literature. In my book, Stars and Silhouettes, A History of the Cameo Role in Hollywood, uh, from Wayne State University Press. I give an account of the cameo as it has been known and used over the last 100 years as a way to reinforce fan participation in celebrity culture. Cameos are often described in ways that account for the brief duration of the role, as an extra, as a bit part, as a secondary role. Other names used to describe the cameo emphasize the aspect of celebrity and recognition that makes cameos stand out from most small roles, such as celebrity flash, guest role, special appearance, or my favorite, special cup of tea, as Dorothy L'Amour's cameo is billed in The Road to Hong Kong from 1962. To discuss the cameo, I like Ernest Matthijs' definition, which is a role where performers are recognizable for their public persona, rather than the character they play. Rather than remain in the background of the story, the cameo role stands out to audiences as it briefly breaks with fiction to display a real-life character. And cameo roles do stand out in the marketing of films and in audiences' minds. Here is one cameo that is often used as an exemplar of the type from Sunset Boulevard in 1950, where we're introduced to a small part that stands out for recognition. In this cameo, we see, along with other less recognizable silent stars, Buster Keaton giving characteristically distraught faces while playing bridge with former silent star Gloria Swanson. Media theorist Marshall McLuhan's appearance in line at a movie theater in Nanny Hall is another well-recognized cameo. Alfred Hitchcock is known for crossing paths with his protagonists in his films, here he is missing a bus in the opening to North by Northwest. Cameos continue to be relevant. Think of Martha Stewart serving up jello shots to a PTA meeting in Bad Moms. All of these parts are small roles that ask that the audience recognize that the actor is not merely a character in a fictional story, but that he or she has a real life counterpart. This coincidence of real life and fiction introduced by the cameo creates a moment of what Vivian Sobchak calls documentary space in a film. Some have argued that all actors carry this aura of documentary space and that casting essentially makes use of the existing star persona to create believable characters in a short amount of time. 
these star personas are compounded by audiences from many years worth of movie parts, talk show interviews, press, and social media interventions. Of course, a star carries this persona into the film with him or her, whether in a small part or a starring role. There's no denying that audiences view each role a star plays through the perspective of that star's public biography. Yet, in a feature role, in a feature film, although the viewer may begin by seeing only the star, the viewer gradually collects information about the film's character that belongs solely to that fictional world. Because of the short duration of a cameo, the brief and almost wordless time that Keaton spends on screen, for example, in a cameo, the persona overshadows the character the actor is supposed to play. Rather than slowly layer the biography of a character onto the star's existing persona, the cameo disrupts fiction, puncturing the story with a recognizable face that is primarily recognizable from the real world. Alex Wolock points out the difference between small roles and main characters, saying that small roles or minor characters usually have a very small character space to fill. They exist merely to fill out the field of characters against which a main character can react and interact, developing and revealing the depth of the main character's character space. When a star performs in a feature-length role, his persona combines with the main character's character space to create a fully formed human that the audience can believe in. When a star performs in a small role, like a cameo, his persona overflows the character space usually allotted for a small role. Rather than merely being a cipher for the main character's own interactions, the star in a cameo role stands out because there's so much popular knowledge already assigned to them by the audience. The audience, familiar with the cameoist's own story, cannot accept him as a mere bridge player, or uh, a bus passenger, or a groom, or a hostess, or whatever role the cameoist takes on. As a performer, the cameoist is also special. While extras are empty signifiers that escape the attention of the movie-making machine, as Paul Willemson suggests, the cameoist likewise stands apart from the action, yet he or she receives special attention, not only in the reception, but also in the production of the film. Willemson, talking about extras, suggests that extras always partly play themselves as they seek to orient themselves within the film environment. Cameoists play themselves because they likewise have little rooting in the film. But unlike the extra, this incoherence is strangely foregrounded. The cameo stands out, but it also provides a link to the real world in a way that the feature performance carrying the weight of the film's story does not. While stars and character actors are used to tell a fictional story, cameoists appear to tell a story about the real world and how it interacts with the film and its production. Cameos shatter an audience's suspension of disbelief and call attention to the elaborate, behind-the-scenes negotiations that have brought the cameoist on screen at this very moment. The cameo calls into consideration the imperatives that require actors to appear on screen, highlighting relationships between actors, writers, directors, and producers. Of course, all of these attributes and imperatives are not necessarily unique to the cameo, but audiences have been encouraged to think about cameos in this way through a long-standing tradition of film publicity. This marketing has used the cameo as a brief part by someone recognized for their real-world persona to uh, create links to the world that ostensibly exists behind the scenes. Marketing around cameos asks audience to consider the links that tether the cameoist, their fame, and their skills to the production. The cameo emerged as a role distinct from other small parts by drawing attention to its own production rather than having the small character recede into the story's background, a form that crystallized in Hollywood's late studio era. Cameos have never been the product of happenstance. From their very earliest occurrence, cameos set aside important figures for recognition. The first instance that I have found where it's clear that performers are meant to be recognized as themselves is in a Vitagraph romance from 1912, 
where the executives from uh, the Vitagraph company, a film company, appear as themselves in a backstage comedy involving a senator's daughter who rises in the film company to become a star. Exhibitor magazines from the time, and also newspaper reviews, indicate that the executives were meant to be recognized as themselves, rather than merely standing in for a, an archetype of important executive. Collaboration and sharing of roles was common in early film companies, but the way that these roles were pointed out in accompanying accounts shows that they weren't meant to blend in with the film's fiction. In fact, a still from the film was used as a portrait of the three executives in a magazine story about the powerful trio as late as 1918. This association with the portrait is an important one uh, to help us understand the cameo. It helps us imagine how the cameo is set apart from the extra. Portraits where important figures and authors appear as themselves in the background for quiet recognition date back to the early modern period. Patron portraits and artist portraits in this case represent the networks of patronage and power. The special attention paid by the artist to otherwise anonymous figures can only be deciphered by viewers familiar with those in power are familiar with the symbols that represent them and the complex family and political relationships conveyed in their portraits through symbols and characterizations. Yet, unlike these portraits of financial and political masters, film celebrity largely glorifies actors, both because of and with continued visibility, as Natalie Hynek suggests. As Daniel Borston puts it, modern celebrities are known for being well known. While the cameo of a king or a patron represents hidden power, the celebrity cameo represents only hidden visibility. Throughout the 1920s, cameos reflected the studio's growing investment in movie stars. Cameos showed who was on the studio's roster and acknowledged the growing fan expertise created by gossip columns, uh, film magazines, and regular film-going habits. Cameos provided inside information by giving audiences a glimpse of the star, not the character they played. Then, as now, fans were fascinated with acting and actors. Acting seemed to be both leisure and work, rewarding the effortlessness of simply being oneself with the unimaginable wealth of thousands of dollars a week at a time when many made that much in a year. The promise of independence and riches, drew many people to Hollywood, some physically following their dream to work as actors, while others followed along from the sidelines at the movie theater. Fans and fan magazines kept tabs on what was authentic and what was pretend in Hollywood, noting details like who did their own stunts or which on-screen garments were from an actor's own closet. Cameos rewarded fans eager for more intimate views of Hollywood and its stars. Cameos themselves were used as documentary evidence of stars' real lives, providing insider views of celebrities at leisure to curious fans. Showing leisure as the flip side of work was an important part of the cameo. Early cameos showed stars uh, playing tennis or sharing meals together, offering up a juxtaposition of femme fatale and, and comedic leads joined together in the real world of the studio. Despite the obvious imperatives from studio publicists guiding who could be seen where, cameos were often offered up as unfettered views of stars. The premise that stars were not merely performing leisure with cameos, but participating in it was an important part of the cameo's status as a window on star realities. Cameos presented a myth of leisure, camaraderie, and cooperation that continues in the cameo to this day. Stars unexpectedly stooping to perform the work of extras had to be accounted for with the idea that they were not just unskilled placeholders playing the part of a convincing background of leisure, as most extras would be, but really spending their free time. Cameos position celebrated figures in the paths of main characters, but what they're celebrated for is not always important. In Annie Hall, for example, 
uh, Fellini was supposed to step in to explain his film to the audience waiting in line in the movie theater. Uh, but Marshall McLuhan was a substitute uh, with equal cultural capital to, to bestow on Woody Allen by taking his side. McLuhan is a less fitting cameo cameoist for uh, a movie theater scene than the director Fellini. But the substitution is unexpectedly seamless to watchers of the film. Like those Renaissance portraits, where glances and attention conveyed important messages about power, the attention of and to a cameoist can be an important signifier. Unlike savvy viewers, main characters often make the mistake of failing to recognize celebrities, demonstrating their innocence or mere unfitness to operate in a society where pop culture reigns. What matters is not so much who the celebrity is as their visibility, and that they are recognized by characters and audiences alike. In a 1928 film, Show People, there's a really interesting use of the cameo showing stars purportedly at leisure. Show People's initial treatment in the mid-1920s suggested cameos that would largely feature Hearst newspaper regulars like gossip columnist Luella Parsons. Instead, the actual film from 1928, which featured Marion Davies, uh, William Randolph Hearst's mistress at the time, showed her lunching with movie stars as Davies' social influence had grown to command the presence of movie colony personalities rather than simply the Hearst employees that one might expect uh, to be present in a film that was partially financed by Hearst. Even more interestingly, the cameoists in Marion Davies' lunch scene were not even entirely MGM regulars. Instead, the actors were from among the highest ranks of film celebrity, uh, including heartthrob Douglas Fairbanks and cowboy actor William S. Hart. The film demonstrates a network that extended beyond the limits of publicizing the studio towards furthering Marion's status as the center of Hollywood attention. However, the studio had its own message to convey with the cameos, and when MGM handled the publicity for the film, it distributed stills of this luncheon scene, reorganized to feature MGM stars at the center. Here, in this still, we also see Billy Haynes, an MGM star who was not part of the shoot for the film, and Douglas Fairbanks is conspicuously absent. While cameos had reflected studio ownership, as stars gained more freedom from restrictive contracts in the 1940s, these strict reflections of contractual obligations were no longer the norm. Instead, personal relationships that reflected social groups outside the studios became important. Multi-platform celebrities like comedian Bob Hope used cameos that reflected his relationships across media. It's hard to imagine Bob Hope as an edgy comic. However, in the 1940s, his brand of self-referential comedy that attacked the glamour of the film industry and its conventions was provocative. As a multimedia performer, he cultivated relationships beyond studio lines and across rival networks. Almost all of his films featured cameos by his Paramount co-star, Bing Crosby, the crooner, with whom he regularly appeared in the Road series of films. In these films, Crosby and Hope played vaudevillians, holed up in far-flung locations and inevitably stumbling into the rescue of the exotic Dorothy Lemoore from a variety of kidnappers. Yet unlike earlier cameos, which generally used cameoists as cheap labor either because they were already under contract or because they had long passed their prime billing years, the style of cameo in these Hope Crosby films rarely presented cameoists in a typical Hollywood setting. Instead, they wandered into unexpected places like deep jungles and windswept plains, calling attention to the fact that these locales were nothing more than backlot sets where actors were naturally at home. Hope's cameos privileged jokes about Hollywood, 
over the narrative of the film and called attention to celebrity in a way that excited audiences. Cameos that showed bona fide stars in background roles were a big draw emphasized in a film's publicity, but they also acquired their own narratives to explain the apparent demotion. The idea of the cameo as a favor among friends was a regular part of the publicity for films that contained cameos, whether they were compensated or not. That these friendly appearances, unlike larger parts that required preparation and rehearsal, could be squeezed in with little effort, uh, a free half hour between recordings, and no costumes, appealed to fans who wanted those unfettered glimpses of stars. The attitude of effortlessness and spontaneity that Crosby cultivated in his performances and publicity reflected on the cameos for which he became well known. Yet for stars balancing the dual properties of talent and hard work that Richard Dyer identifies as being integral to the star identity, the cameo's increasing casualness and promise of close access to the person without the veneer of character could be seen to be dangerous to the star image. Many stars, such as Elizabeth Taylor, were forbidden by studios from performing in cameo roles. Small roles, MGM argued, diminished stars, and they might have been right. Cameo fatigue set in in the 1960s as stars of all kinds turned up in cameos. Today, many cameos continue to undercut star image, emphasizing not talent or ability, but instead competing to show views of stars that are unflattering to a degree that present, presents a new layer of performance and self-parody. Audiences use cameos to piece together relationships between actors, producers, directors, writers, and other participants in the filmmaking process. These relationships certainly carry weight in the casting of a cameo. Cameos are, after all, largely interchangeable. They present an opportunity for extra textual reference that engages audiences in a largely comedic vein, diverting attention away from the plot and the main characters. Cameos rely on personal relationships, but they also rely on a cameoist's interest in visibility and attention. Even the act of casting a cameo that doesn't appear in the final film can be newsworthy. In interviews that accompanied the publicity for The Fault in Our Stars, a 2014 teen drama adapted from a hit young adult novel, the author of the book frequently mentioned a cameo that was shot of him in an airport that ultimately was cut out of the final film. The bid for the cameo is as important for audience recognition as the actual cameo itself. The casting of the cameo reflects financial imperatives, but it also reflects personal ones. These two motives are tied inextricably together, both in the production and in the reception of the cameo in Hollywood films. Thanks for taking the time to listen to my talk about research at TRU. Have a good evening.